In the far northwest reaches of the American continent, a massive gorilla-like biped. You know, I was shocked for a minute that this, this, is it an animal or could I call it a person or whatever, that it disappeared in front of me. Stalks the forest with slow, heavy strides. Locals call him Sasquatch. Canada's Yukon Territory, a wild land with some 484,000 square kilometers of forest, populated by 250,000 caribou and just 35,000 inhabitants. There are no skyscrapers and few highways here. Nature's vastness provides the only backdrop. Here, the great outdoors is a way of life. Yukoners never hesitate to wander in the forests. But some locals have heard strange noises. What they fear is Sasquatch, Bigfoot's Canadian cousin, a hairy monster of imposing proportions. On July 12, 2011, Ed Trishter had the surprise of his life. Okay, let's come, uh, let's go down here where it actually started. <laughs> At the time when this happened, I lived up here and I came down here quite slow and I didn't pay much attention to anything till I got past this telephone pole here and all of a sudden I see something walking there. And I came up beside it and I said, that's a Sasquatch. Man walks like this, right? He walked like this. And he kept a good pace, you know. And I drove up right up front and I said, I'll wait till he comes around the telephone pole. And he was gone. I, I was, uh, you know, just sort of looking. I said, what's going on? Never saw him again. Disappeared right, right there. It's a mystery to me. I sort of said, wow, hmm, I better not tell anybody about this. <laughs> because it was two years before I told my daughter. Because I didn't want to be called crazy. <laughs> you never know. His daughter, Rhonda, chose to believe her father. After all, up here, Sasquatch sightings are common. We're just sitting there nonchalantly. And he just, we're eating, and he's just like, oh, yeah. You know, I seen, we're coming home one day, I seen this Bigfoot. I'm like, huh? Where? And he said, well, down the hill. So, yeah, he showed me, but it was just like nothing. Just blurted it out as we're eating. <laughs> but then when we walked today, with the dip, it made it taller. Because when he said it to me, it didn't sound as tall. But then after we went and stood in the ditch, then it's like that would add about a foot. So that's pretty awesome. You know, be neat to see. Rhonda insisted that her father share his secret. Well, I knew Red is doing Bigfoot and stories and that, so I thought, I've got to tell Red. So I told Red. <laughs> Red wanted to know if he could get hold of Dad and talk to him. I said, I'll, I'll ask Dad, and Dad was, I told Dad that Red wanted to talk to him, and he was agreeable. So, and then that's how it all started. The Sasquatch expert she's referring to is Red Grossinger, a veteran of the Canadian Army who has been passionate about the Sasquatch since 2003. He has published a book, The Sasquatch Research Manual, and spends much of his free time tracking the monster. Through my years visiting around the Yukon, people have told me stories. So since 2003, I've been really digging into the history of Sasquatch. He was sort of and he's going like this. That was fascinated me, you know? Red has had dozens of meetings just like this one in recent years. They all have one thing in common. Witnesses are reluctant to go public. He had always kept that story uh, secret. 
he might have told something partly to some people which thought that he was only joking. Uh, but uh, you know, just how he recently he came out with it. Ronda always says, carry the, carry the camera, you see. Well, I'm, I ordered a couple of gold. He's, uh, I believe he's German descent. Uh, he's a white person. Uh, and I found a lot of time the white folks are not quite as open to deal with, with the Sasquatch. For them, it, you know, it takes a while to understand it more, so. Hmm. Something I, oh. I ordered something. <laughs> That's good. It was just a few kilometers from Whitehorse that Ed saw the monster. With 28,000 inhabitants, it is the largest city in the Yukon. Of course, Sasquatches are not an everyday sight. Even here, nature is not far away. Whitehorse is the last trace of civilization before the terrain gives way to endless, unspoiled forest. And the man who directs Whitehorse's affairs is particularly proud of his city. Hi, my name is Dan Curtis. I'm the mayor of the city of Whitehorse, Yukon. I was born right over there in that hospital, right across the river. So we're, we're a few meters away from my birthplace. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's been, uh, it's been great. I love the Yukon. I think we all do. I think the thing that makes us uh, so special is the people. The people are fantastic here. Many places in Canada and the world, I think you have to be from there uh, and live there for your whole life, for generations to be really accepted. But here, it accepts you and you choose it. It chooses you. So. And tourism is a huge component for us as well. It's the largest employer outside of government. One of the things I'm not so proud of is our traffic. Rarely do they stop uh, in time. So you're really taking your life in your own hands when you're traveling on our streets. What distinguishes Whitehorse from other cities north of the 60th parallel is it's monster, of course. Uh, Sasquatch, quite a bit, actually. It's uh, been quite a legend within our First Nations for many, many years. It's something to be pretty cool if they did find one, but uh, we, we do have so much density within the Yukon. There's areas that very few people get to, so it's quite feasible that if one exists, it's, it could very well be within the borders of, uh, of Yukon. And I think for uh, the people I've talked to and the sightings I've heard about, this is the place. Up here, everyone has their own Sasquatch story. I think a lot of people would have more of a fear surrounding it, for sure. Like, it's like some kind of a predator, right? It sounded big. Like a big, 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 something bigger than it, than a wolf or a dog or... It was like nothing I'd ever, ever heard in my life before. Nothing predestined Red Grossinger to a life of Sasquatch obsession. This retired military man's passion developed after an extraordinary experience. I was out fishing with a friend of mine on Frenchman Lake, which is uh, about central Yukon. And uh, we were enjoying fun, nice sunny day, no wind at all. We were in a small bay and all of a sudden came a strong smell. Uh, something I've never ever smelled in my life. To me, it was something that smelled like um, a mix of uh, dirty baby diapers with dog manure and pig manure. And if you mix them together, it would come up with that stink. And something that burned my eyes, actually. I mean, I was crying, it, it burned so much. And uh, there were no birds chirping around at all. No squirrels running. It was like in a dead zone. Now, being a bit curious, I decided to find out what it would be. So that got me going. And since that day, I've been doing research. The Sasquatch is a biped standing eight feet tall, its body completely covered with long black hair. Its feet measure some 24 inches. This colossus burns 7,000 calories a day to survive and is said to be lonely but fearful of humans. It is heard in the forest by a loud, ear-piercing screech. The nose could almost be described as a, a nose of a fighter, where it's fairly wide. and On the male, genitalia are not quite visible because of the hair again, but the breasts of the females are very uh, visible. Somewhere here, 
There we go. Uh, notice the torso that is so big as well. And the head is fairly small as compared to the rest of the body. I have a footprint here of a Sasquatch. And that you cannot be mistaken for anything but a Sasquatch. Christopher Reynolds is a journalist for the White Horse Daily Star, which was founded in 1900, making it the oldest daily paper in the Yukon. Chris was born in Toronto, but he has made the Yukon his new home. The Sasquatch, it's sort of this mythic specter, or not necessarily mythic, lingering in the collective consciousness, you could say, of, uh, of the North. Uh, let's see here. What have we got here? Here we go. I think when Red Grossinger arrived in the Yukon, he revived an interest that had only been vague and not really officialized in, say, newspaper pages. These um, red dots are where Sasquatch had been either observed or there were his footprints. And the fact that he was involved with this uh, Sasquatch, Canadian Sasquatch Research Organization, lent, in some folks' eyes, uh, a measure of credibility. In 1967, two California filmmakers captured on film what they believed to be a Bigfoot. Despite having its validity challenged by scientists, the footage sparked a storm of interest. From the Yukon to Northern California, budding cryptozoologists emerged with an interest in large, hairy bipeds. That film has been analyzed and analyzed over and over, over again, uh, where people first thought it was somebody in a monkey suit or something, but the analysis uh, of that uh, all can all confirm that it is an actual creature, an actual Sasquatch. So that was one of the first film ever taken of a Sasquatch that has been proven to be true. But one event revived Sasquatch fever in the region. In 2005, uh, a man from Teslin came across uh, a footprint in the mud outside of this small community south of Whitehorse. And soon after, a tuft of hair was, was located. Uh, and there was great suspicion that this may be evidence of a Sasquatch. This footprint was not normal. It didn't match up to any other creatures. In the, in, the, in the area, and I think there have been rumors circulating around the communities as well uh, up until that point. When this was reported to several news organizations, the CBC, the White Horse Star, and a little later, uh, the Yukon News, uh, all reported on this discovery. At the time, Philip Merchant worked for the Yukon government. It was he who took charge of the investigation. Well, the first I heard of it was from a conservation officer who was in Teslin, who was asked to, uh, to come and have a look at some samples and some tracks also. Uh, he took a bunch of uh, photographs of the tracks. He um, um, collected the sample and uh, that somebody had found at the site. It came to me in the lab. We had, uh, our lab was done a bunch of hair work uh, investigative work around kill sites to try to identify predators and that kind of thing. So we had done quite a lot of uh, hair work on wolves, on uh, bears, uh, lynx, um, various predators. So we knew a bit about hair. You know, certainly all the scientific literature was available to us. When the, when the event was published in the newspaper, I believe Dave Coltman at the University of Alberta uh, saw a copy or heard of it on, the, on CBC or maybe online, I'm not sure. And he contacted us and said, hey, you know, send, us, send us a sample of this and we'll run it. We'll run it and see what it comes up with as far as DNA. As he offered, I thought, oh, sure, let's, let's take it to the next step. These are the pages out of the scrapbook that uh, some folks put together for me when I retired. And oddly enough, out of 30 years of working with, with mammals, uh, the Sasquatch makes it into my, <laughs> my scrapbook. I didn't realize that the incident in Yukon actually prompted 
a scientific investigation beyond just a simple DNA sample. There was actually a paper written on it. Well, the paper is just a description of the, uh, of the DNA analysis uh, for DNA molecular geneticists who understand this stuff. You know, most of this is, is a fairly complex uh, description. And there out there on the limb is, uh, is the sample from the Sasquatch. David Thompson is a fiction writer living in Whitehorse. He's had a lifelong passion for the history and culture of Yukon, which has served as inspiration for his novels. For him, the Yukon is the final frontier, the land of endless possibilities. No wonder the Sasquatch legend has captured the imagination of locals. The main attraction to the Yukon, I think, in the past has been uh, the search for gold. You know, up to about 1850, there was a, a lot of prospectors in the territory, uh, searching all over, not finding great amounts of gold, but finding uh, promising uh, samples that kept them here. And that contributed a lot to, uh, to the development of the territory. The uh, fur traders, they were big. You know, the Hudson Bay Company uh, and the gold miners, as mentioned, and the clergy also came in. The only major development the area has known was a highway linking it to the south, a link that put an end to the region's once total isolation. Up to then, uh, it was uh, villages. Whitehorse was a very small town. They built uh, all kinds of buildings for the army. The army was in, was in control of the highway. They built headquarters here in Whitehorse at Camp Dikini. And uh, it was, I think it's probably a shock to a lot of people who had lived for so long, uh, a village life, really. And uh, I, I, could, I could remember people saying, you know, how, they, how it kind of affected them. It was, it was kind of uh, a stressful time, I would think. Long before the media took an interest in Bigfoot and Sasquatch, Native American tribes incorporated hairy, bipedal, half-human, half-animal creatures into their legends. Moreover, the word Sasquatch originated in languages spoken by the First Nations in northern British Columbia and southern Yukon. I am Tlingit, yeah, from Tesla area. I grew up there. My people have always believed in these beings, and I remember as a child growing up, uh, my, my mom and my grandmas, to keep me quiet, because we lived out on the land, uh, to keep kids quiet, they'd always say, be quiet, you know, the Bushman will get you. That's what they referred to them as. So I know that I've heard stories being, uh, being born and raised here, I can remember when I was a kid hearing stories of a Sasquatch from, from First Nation elders, as well as people that were working on the SS Klondike, picking up firewood along the way. They've, uh, they've seen uh, animals that they were quite certain weren't uh, black bear or grizzly bear, and they're quite convinced that it was a Sasquatch. My husband and I went salmon fishing, netting salmon. This is years back now. We were at uh, uh, our fish camp, and about five and a five o'clock in the morning, we heard this god-awful yell, something I can't describe, but it was so, so loud. And we were all in tents, and we, everybody, I swear to God, lifted out of their beds, ran out, and said, what was that? And I looked around, and there's all my cousins, they're outside their tents, what is that? It, was so loud. I mean, everybody woke up and we're on their feet. Like, what is that? And to this day, like, I've never heard anything like that. Somebody was saying, well, was it a bear? No, I know what a bear sounds like. I know the growls, I know those sounds, you know, um, but I don't know.
I always look for them. Because we've had lots of sightings here, like in the Yukon. Other people had seen them and, you know. So I'd love to see one. I'm always on the uh, look, uh, outlook for something good and interesting. Oh, I, I just probably grab my camera and start taking pictures or chase it or something, you know? I take a picture too, you know? <laughs> he had a good stride on him and, uh, and never looked sideways. That was so strange also. Was it uh, just a dream while I was driving, you know, but it wasn't. It is north of Whitehorse, 100 kilometers or 62 miles from the capital, that Red Grossinger focuses his efforts to catch the Sasquatch. So this is a Bihar right here. We'll take this road along the river, around Long Lake, and we'll go all the way up and then we'll turn right. Now there may be a couple of water puddles here, so we have to be careful once we get on that secondary trail. Anyway, so we'll take you guys there for a few minutes and see what's happening. Put it this way, I haven't seen one anywhere around here yet. That'd be nice to see one. <laughs> uh, so, hey, who knows? Who knows? Because there's been sighting everywhere, so. It is estimated that over 75% of the region is untouched by human activity. The boreal forest, home of the Sasquatch, is composed almost entirely of black and white spruce. Up here, the average summer temperature is 11 degrees Celsius, or 51 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, let's get at it then. I'm not an outdoor door person, not, not like it. We, we go camping, but uh, uh, I prefer a trailer and the convenience. If we're not back within three days, Marie, we're stuck somewhere. No, we <laughs> oh, we got phone, oh yeah, we got phone nowadays. <laughs> There we are, so we'll jump in the truck. Well, I look at a few of his things. I read his book. Oh, I got a, uh, a light Sasquatch research, research kit. GPS, they, they're important because it shows you where we see something. Camera, VCR, that kind of stuff. I got night visions and uh, uh, trail camera as well. Never know. I have to see one. <laughs> we need a bit of sightseeing, so we'll take over the road. I try to go out as often as possible, checking different places where there has been other sighting or reports. I think folks up here, as in many small communities, smaller communities are more laid back. I think folks are a lot more in touch with nature. That's a bit of a cliche, but it's so true in very remote places like the Yukon, and I think Northwest Territories in Nunavut, where there's not a lot of urban sprawl at all. When you're outside of small urban centers, all you have are the trees or, depending on how north you are, how far north, the tundra. Uh, so there is a real engagement with the wilderness surrounding you. Folk, you know, hunting licenses and permits are incredibly cheap up here. Uh, it's not an uncommon to come across people with trap lines nearby or to have uh, fed themselves 25% on moose stored in their deep freeze for the winter. Uh, so there is an engagement with nature and a, a laid-back attitude, I would say. What evidence does Red Grossinger look for in the forest? Broken tree trunks, which he says can only be the work of the Sasquatch. Now this tree was broken probably a little while back. This tree sap here that's almost dry, yeah. 
and it would probably be broken coming down this way, yet it has been moved over there. But there's nothing here that the wind would have caught, and this is well protected, so how did that happen? A human being had to be awfully strong to grab a tree like that and break it. I know I can't. Now, if Sasquatch was to break that, would I put a hand somewhere here, like that? That's five feet, yeah. So I'll venture a little way here and see if there's anything else. I'm against shooting it now. In order to have absolute proof, the scientists would require a dead body. Now, if you happen to shoot one and find a dead one, remove the head. Take the head with you, at least. Nothing else, take the head. Most Sasquatch witnesses are struck by its deafening cry. So Red Grossinger has perfected his own Sasquatch call to attract the monster. Sometimes we call them to see if they would respond, but usually that takes a little while. Sasquatch answer Grossinger's call? Oh! Ah, nothing. Oh, that could, don't it could respond a little, quite a bit later. It has different, different sounds. Some, some of the sound is like, go whoop. Some of the sound is whoop. It all depends. It's, uh, if a person was able to uh, do an interpretation of each type of call, and be able to understand something better. For example, coyote have an ability to have different sounds, and even for a small animal, it still can really have a, a very loud voice. So a lot of people mistake coyote for that. But where could the Sasquatch have come from? Grant Zazula is a paleontologist working for the Yukon government. He specializes in the study of fossilized remains. Well, a paleontologist is a person that studies ancient life, uh, plants and animals of the past. And in the Yukon, uh, we have a very uh, impressive record of Ice Age mammals that are preserved in the frozen permafrost of the Yukon. So the, the paleontology program works uh, to go and collect Ice Age fossils of mammoths and short-faced bears and Ice Age lions and animals such as this. And we, we do research and, and try to educate the public on, on these sort of topics. Well, the Yukon Beringi Interpretive Center was uh, built in 1996, and it's basically a facility to tell the story of Beringia, which is the Ice Age landscape which collect, connected Asia with North America during the Ice Age. And it was also the landscape of the first people in, um, who lived in North America used to migrate from Asia into this continent. So Beringia is a pretty important place scientifically for sure. Could the Sasquatch have miraculously survived the Ice Age? Red Grossinger explains the theory first developed by the American anthropologist Grover Krantz. If so, the Sasquatch's most likely ancestor would be the Gigantopithecus, a giant gorilla thought to have been extinct for 100,000 years. This guy here, Grover Grants, he was a professor at the University of Wisconsin. And this is what he made of Gigantopithecus right here. So that is what he believes, and many people believe, the ancestor of the North American Sasquatch. And basically, they came here during uh, what has been called the last ice age. So they were First Nation coming in, animals, everything from Asia came across. 
And the theory is, and I believe in that, is that Gigantopithecus came across as well. Around uh, 13 or 14,000 years ago, um, global climates start to warm up substantially and uh, glaciers on the continents melt, sea level starts to rise, and this grassland, the steppe tundra grassland, starts to become transformed back into a boreal forest like we have today. And that time also was an important time because of the extinctions of a lot of these Ice Age mammals. So woolly mammoths on the continent go extinct, Ice Age horses in North America go extinct, and a lot of the predators like lions and simtar cats go extinct as well. So it's a major upheaval, a lot of transition happening, and it was a real period of environmental change and bio biogeographic change. Can the Sasquatch be the lone exception to the rule, a creature that cheated death, surviving through all of the Earth's climatic changes? When you study, study fossils, uh, there's not really much connection to fossils and Sasquatch. I don't, it's not a very relevant connection anyways. Um, but, um, you know, people talk about Sasquatch and these types of animals, and it's more of, a, in my understanding, a, a joking sort of way, but the, the idea is lacking evidence for sure. An opinion shared by the author David Thompson. Placer miners have dug up hundreds of miles of creeks. They've knocked tops off mountains, looking for gold, fighting the gold. They've, bore, they've, they've tunneled down uh, our, uh, 40 feet into the permafrost. They've tunneled, they've dug it up, and they've brought up all kinds of bones. They even found a 700,000-year-old horse preserved in permafrost, and it was flesh and bone and skin. It had a white mane and a white tail, and they dug that up. And not once has anybody ever brought up anything that resembles a Sasquatch. But the Sasquatch has all the necessary skills to survive through the ages, argues Red Grossinger. He even believes it would have possessed a superior intellect. The proof? The Sasquatch has developed its own system of communication using wooden sticks. Amazing. Yeah, what I could do is go back to the truck and grab my stick and do a couple of bang and see what happened. Who knows? Who knows? I'll try that one there, see what happened. So much for that stick. <laughs> No response anywhere. But in a time when each of us walks around with cameras built into our smartphones, it seems surprising that no one has managed to take a photograph of the monster. If you have a camera and have enough calm to take a photo, take a photo. Simple as that, and try to realize and try to uh, take notes in order to describe what you've seen but you find that 99% of people are such, so in shock, they don't think about it. There's many, many reports people said, you know, there's, there it was, right there. A lot of people travel with camera and they are there too amazed to look at it. Whether flesh and blood monster or pure legend, the Sasquatch has certainly left its mark on popular culture in the Yukon. Absolutely, people believe in it. The Sasquatch doesn't come up necessarily in daily conversation, but you will have things like a band referencing the, uh, the mythology of the North called Sasquatch Prom Date, a great rockabilly band, by the way. Things like in our paper, even every day, there's the basically the Sasquatch hotline, uh, although the hotline is actually an email calling out for folks who have uh, witnessed either the Sasquatch, him or herself, or signs of that great hominid. These are men and women like Red Grossinger, firm believers in the myth. For this veteran of the army, there is no question of abandoning the search. So that's uh, pretty high up. The two first three, I would, I would say those were from Sasquatch, simply because of the height and the location. Some of the others in the back, I wouldn't, 
they probably would be uh, wind blow or natural broken. I have to admit that I don't believe in uh, a creature known as the Sasquatch or Bigfoot. It's viewed with skepticism in the journalistic community. In fact, so much so that among journalists, it probably comes up a lot less than, say, uh, zoning changes or parking bylaws and stimulating seizing issues of that nature. But not so much so that it doesn't come up in the newspaper or on CBC News once in a while. For paleontologist Grant Zazula, the Sasquatch is a myth. Well, of course there's always a possibility of anything until it's, un until it's proven or disproven or evidence is uh, presented. And you know, as far as I know, there's no real evidence for any Sasquatches that live in the Yukon or, or even that were here during the Ice Age. The only evidence for any large hominid during the Ice Age in North America are people, just like you and I. They were built very much the same as us. They weren't nine feet tall and, you know, big and shaggy. We, you know, there's no evidence for that at all. And the only evidence, as far as I know, for any kind of Sasquatch is, you know, circumstantial uh, testimonies by people who saw something in the, in the wilderness, right? And the only scientific, credible scientific study that's ever been done on uh, this, these reported Sasquatch hairs that have been found all over the world you know, quite recently was published and demonstrated, of course, that all those hairs were just animals that we know of today, uh, wolves and bears and other things like that. None of it was actually Sasquatch or it related to you know, early non-human primates or something like that. So, uh, of course, the, the evidence is lacking for Sasquatch, but people still find it quite uh, fun, I guess, to go and look for them. This is the same conclusion reached by Philip Merchant, retired scientist for the Yukon government. The DNA tests proved beyond doubt that the hairs found in Teslin in 2005 were not those of a Sasquatch. Somebody contacted me and wanted some of the hair for a, a Sasquatch museum, and I said, uh, no, you can, you can get some bison hair closer to home. We don't need to be sending you bison hair from the government of the Yukon. <laughs> yeah. And of course, is that uh, so-called bison hair out of Teslin, which makes me laugh every time someone tells me that no, no Sasquatch, there's only bison. Well, the two have nothing related to it because the people that seen that, uh, they've talked talking to the media, obviously. But uh, I've talked with them, and for them, there's no arguments whatsoever. Yeah. That stupid piece of turf hair from bison was someone that killed a bison and threw the bloody thing away. It had nothing to do with it. There's people in the Yukon that believe that they are Elvis. So, you know, you can mix them up in the same lot of individuals that believe in Sasquatch, too. And, and you know, there's colorful and creative people in the Yukon, which makes it an interesting place to live, right? So um, um, all the power to them. But in terms of being, uh, you know, a scientist and trying to relay scientific information to the public, you know, there's absolutely no evidence and very, very, very limited possibility that any Sasquatches could be here. I would have to say that uh, I was pretty convinced that that hair was what I thought it was, and that was bison based on the texture and the smell and everything else. Um, the chances of uh, a creature like that living in the Yukon are, are remote in the extreme, uh, undetected. There's been people here for a long time. Um, when you get nine people who have seen something, if you don't follow up, then people start asking, well, why didn't you follow up? You know, so uh, uh, to some degree, it's as much showing that it isn't as showing that it is. And of course, the so-called uh, scientific people take that as an excuse. Mm -hmm. To me, that's all it is, a bloody excuse.
For author David Thompson, the Sasquatch is a fictional character, but one with huge importance for the Yukon. Well, I make my Sasquatches, they're compassionate, they're intelligent, they're companions to humans who they trust. They, they're smart, they have a language. The language is uh, a series of whistles. That's why dogs like them, because they can have that silent whistle. And if you're ever camping and your dog runs off in the bush, it might be a Sasquatch calling them and throwing a stick for them. But they're just really good characters to write about. He recently wrote a new piece on the monster for a local newspaper. Okay, this is the, uh, what's up, Yukon? It's an artsy paper. So they had a contest, and the contest was that Condor Air would fly you to Frankfurt from Whitehorse if you could write a 500-word story telling them who you would take with you. So I said, if I won the trip for two to Frankfurt, I would take the Sasquatch that lives in the forest behind my house with me. See, the Sasquatch that lives in the forest behind my house is called Flunder. And he was a good friend, and he wanted to visit the uh, Teutoburg Forest in Germany uh, to see if he has any relatives there. So I didn't win, but I did get my story written to the paper, and I hope people enjoyed it. I've never actually saw one myself. Well, there is people that come in here looking for uh, books and such, uh, any sort of literature on, on Sasquatches. Just because it's, uh, it's you know, the, in the Yukon, it's the magic and the mystery. People have uh, see, you know, seen and done things that other people haven't, so there's always that, you know, uh, that desire to go out and do something that other people haven't seen or done, so, yeah. I wouldn't say that I don't believe them. Uh, I, same with UFOs, I wouldn't say that I'm not a believer of them, but uh, I go on the premise that uh, until I actually see them, then I, I make physical uh, eye contact with it, then I would say that I'm a 100% believer. Right now, I'm right on the fence. The region's natural beauty has made it a draw for tourists, but the Sasquatch still arouses curiosity and amazement. I don't know much of anything, and I do not believe that there is such a thing. Well, I've seen pictures of what they think it looks like. It's supposed to be a upright standing monster of a bear or a long-haired monster, I guess. I don't know. Big. But I've never seen one and I, you know, I don't think there are any either. To the First Nations who represent 23% of the population of the Yukon, the Sasquatch deserves our respect. Now, I know my people believe that uh, these beings have, I'm not sure how to describe this, but I'm gonna say supernatural powers. They can disappear, they can appear, they can disappear. And uh, my people tell me, my elders tell me that I need to be respectful of these beings at all times. People keep looking for them. Good luck. <laughs> keep looking. <laughs> Send me email if you find one, will you? I have yet to see the Sasquatch myself, uh, but I know that we do um, we do have a burger named the Sasquatch, and uh, and there is quite a few uh, art uh, depictions of the Sasquatch as to what people think uh, this uh, this mythic creature looks like. I didn't see enough of him. You know, I mean, to see a creature like that is something else. Yeah, I wish I could see one again. Well, if they're not reproducing and they're not uh, mating and having babies, it's hard to keep a population going. Uh, there's not a lot of animals that survive, have a lifespan of 300 years. <laughs> that's, uh, that's quite fantastic. Uh, I, think it, I think there's actually one of them in my Dungeons and Dragons monster manual, but uh, I don't, you know, it's, that's a different ball game. But obviously they exist, they're there. They may be well looking at us right now, we won't see them, but who knows, one of these days. <laughs>